Good to have you with us. You're watching Arirang News. It's 4 p.m. here in Seoul, and I'm Na Hyun Gyeong. Officials from China and the U.S. are holding back-to-back -back talks with South Korea this week. In today's meeting with Seoul Foreign Ministry officials, U.S. Assistant Secretary of State Daniel Russell commented on a Chinese official's remarks from yesterday. Here's Arirang's Foreign Affairs Ministry correspondent, Hwang Song hee just a day after China voiced concerns over the possible deployment of the Thought missile defense system in South Korea, the United States said China doesn't have a say in the matter. Well, I find it curious that uh, a third country would uh, presume to uh, make strong representations about a security uh, system that has not been uh, put in place and that is uh, still a uh, matter of theory. Chinese Assistant Minister of Foreign Affairs Liu Jianchao told reporters in Seoul on Monday that China hopes South Korea will consider Beijing's concerns before deploying the U.S.-led missile defense system. Beijing is against the deployment over concerns that the radar system, which can cover 1,000 kilometers, could be used to monitor mainland China. But following talks with senior South Korean officials in Seoul on Tuesday, U.S. Assistant Secretary of State Daniel Russell said that is purely for countering North Korean threats and that its deployment is up to South Korea. It is um, for the Republic of Korea uh, to decide uh, what measures uh, it will take in its own alliance defense and when. The U.S. envoy remained wary about Seoul's participation in China's Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, saying Beijing should first ensure the transparency of the new financial institution. So every government can make its own decision about uh, whether the way to achieve that goal is by joining before the articles of agreement are clarified or by waiting uh, to see what the evidence looks like as the bank starts to operate. If South Korea wants to join the AIIB as a founding member, it must confirm its membership by the end of this month. Now, with the clock ticking, Seoul seems to have found itself in a tough spot between its closest partners. Hwang Sang-hee, Arirang News. Well, as you can see, there are another hot topic when it comes to China and the U.S. is the establishment of the China-led Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. With many Western countries declaring to join China's initiative, Washington's concerns may be growing. Connie Kim reports. Concern is growing in Washington as a number of countries are lining up to join the China-led Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Following Britain's decision to join the AIIB last week, France, Germany and Italy announced that they will also take part in the new institution. With the decision, a total of 31 nations have now agreed to join, building muscle from the initial 21 nations that signed up from the beginning. Initially, Australia and South Korea had decided to take a wait-and-see approach, but with big European nations jumping on board, Australia now says it's carefully reviewing its options. Meanwhile, Seoul is expected to announce its plans within its end-of-March deadline. Washington is worried Beijing's new bank could negatively affect U.S.-based institutions. Watchers say the AIIB, which was launched last year by China, is a counterbalance to the U.S.-led World Bank and the Japan-led Asian Development Bank. Not surprisingly, Japan also opposes the AIIB. Tokyo is one of the biggest shareholders in the ADB, meaning it's permitted to make key decisions. China, meanwhile, holds about a 5 percent share in the ADB. Chinese President Xi Jinping has said the new bank will improve global financial governance. Beijing is expected to push to expand its existence in the financial arena, reflecting China's rising global economic influence. The world's second largest economy also plans to create a new development bank that could stand alongside traditional institutions, such as the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. Connie Kim, 
Arirang News. A UN special rapporteur on North Korea has called for an investigation into the many North Koreans working abroad in what he characterized as slave-like conditions. A Seoul-based human rights group says the workers are forced to make foreign currency for the cash-strapped Kim Jong-un regime. Here's Arirang's Shin Se-min. The United Nations human rights investigator for North Korea said he will look into allegations that 20,000 North Koreans are working in slave-like conditions in countries like China, Russia and the Middle East. Marzuki Deruzman, the UN special rapporteur on North Korea, told Reuters the workers are, quote, bonded laborers or slave laborers who receive poor compensation for working long hours. NK Watch, a Seoul-based human rights group, says roughly 100,000 workers are sent overseas to 40 countries and make some 3 billion U.S. dollars in foreign currency every year for the Kim Jong-un regime. There was no reason given for the discrepancy in the estimated numbers of workers. The human rights group also called for an investigation into host countries' involvement in the program. This isn't the first time the practice has surfaced. Activists say North Korea has been using its manpower to make money for the Kim regime since the 1980s, with some of the money being spent on luxury goods. But the practice has been accelerating under the current leadership as the number of North Korean workers abroad is said to have increased by 35,000 since 2012, based on figures from the New York Times and NK Watch. Activists say the practice may have increased because of tighter international sanctions on the regime that have prompted it to seek new sources of revenue. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. And in an unprecedented move, North Korea asked the heads of South Korean companies operating at the inter-Korean industrial complex in Kaesong to gather for a meeting that was scheduled for 11 a.m. today. No specifics about that meeting were announced, and the South Korean government asked the company heads to not respond to Pyongyang's call. Instead, Seoul scheduled a separate meeting for this afternoon with the leaders of the more than 120 firms at the complex to discuss possible countermeasures. Watchers believe the meeting was Pyongyang's way of pressuring the South Korean companies to go along with its unilateral decision to raise wages for its workers from a little over 70 U.S. dollars per month to 74 dollars and revise labor regulations. The government's policy changes and the central bank's key rate cut are all aimed at generating momentum for Korea's economic recovery, but most indicators are still pointing to a slowing economy. With this, some are predicting that Korea will log a sixth consecutive 0% range growth in the first quarter of this year. Song ji has more. It's barely managing to hover above zero. The Korean economy is likely to log another 0% range growth for a sixth straight quarter, inching closer to a nine-quarter record logged between 2011 and 2013. Oil prices may be cheap, but domestic consumption is not catching up, and real economic indicators are showing the telltale signs of a slowing economy. Mining and manufacturing production shrunk at the fastest rate in six years in January, and consumer inflation is also hovering at the 0% range for the third straight month. If the first quarter marks expansion of less than 1%, the Korean economy is likely to settle in the low 3% growth range for the whole of 2015. Foreign investment banks have already downwardly revised their outlook, with some predicting growth in the 2% range. Domestic research institutes are also reportedly ready to adjust their figures. After slashing the key interest rate to an all-time low of 1.75 percent last week, Korea's central bank also hinted that its 3.4 percent growth outlook will be downgraded in its next forecast in April. Song Ji-sun, Arirang News. 
Being a college graduate can be a privilege at times, but it looks like that's not always the case when it comes to getting a job here in Korea. According to a report released by LG Economics Research Institute today, more college graduates are jobless than those with high school diplomas. While the unemployment rate for high school grads dropped 0.2 percentage points from 2005 to 8.9% last year, the rate rose for those out of college from 6% to a near 10%. Analysts say this is largely because employers, including big companies, are hiring a larger proportion of high school graduates. Korea has opened its seventh innovation center in the southeastern port city of Busan. The government hopes to transform Busan's manufacturing-centered economy into a service-led growth engine for the future. Experts say commitment from the corporate community will be key to its success. Choi Yusan reports. In cooperation with retail giant Lotte Group, Korea's latest innovation center in Busan will set up a $200 million fund to foster personnel and support startups in distribution, film and the Internet of Things. It plans to offer a one-stop counseling service on development, marketing and commercialization of innovative products and help diversify Busan's traditionally strong shoe and fisheries industries. 전통 상품은 물론 혁신 제품의 가치와 상품성을 높여서 한국의 대표 상품으로 도약하게 만드는 유통 혁신의 거점이 될 것입니다. Lotte, which also runs an entertainment business, will join hands with the government's new cultural creativity complex to build an ecosystem for Korea's film industry. In line with the government's goal to establish a global Internet of Things hub by 2019, the Busan Center will test potential commercialization of related technologies and nurture startups that integrate the technologies in the safety and tourism sectors. As part of President Buck's creative economy drive, the government plans to build 17 innovation centers around the country, each teaming up with a conglomerate to encourage creativity and help fledgling companies commercialize their products globally. The success of these centers is linked to how smoothly conglomerates and SMEs will cooperate, how much of an initiative they will take, and their intent to participate. Placing a greater emphasis on the conglomerate's willingness to generate output, experts say that in order for the PAC administration's innovation initiatives to bear fruit, succeeding administrations will have to continue to support these centers and their projects. Choi Yusan, Arirang News. Now, today, President Park Geun-hye held a three-way meeting with the leaders of Korea's ruling and opposition parties. It was the first time in two years that she and her presidential election rival Moon Jae-in, he's now the opposition party leader, sat down for talks. President Park have talked about achievements from her recent Middle East trip and sought both parties' cooperation in her efforts to revitalize the economy and carry out social reforms. Moon is expected to have pressured the administration to adopt a policy of increasing household income to spur domestic demand. On the security front, sources say he is likely to have talked about a need for the president to hold an inter-Korean summit this year. And before that three-way meeting, the president presided over a cabinet meeting. There, she stressed the importance of rooting out corruption in Korean society. Meeting with some of the new cabinet members for the first time, she said, if illicit practices are left untouched, they will hinder efforts to revitalize the domestic economy. She then asked the prime minister to push ahead with his crackdown on corruption. The president is thought to have reaffirmed her determination in response to recent irregularities in the defense industry, the reelection of duty in overseas resources development, and the creation of slush funds and embezzlement by some conglomerates. With enhanced medical technology and people taking better care of themselves in general, people are staying more active even in what was once considered to be old age. That means the nation's soon-to-be seniors are becoming one of society's major consumer groups. Our Kim Min-ji has this story. 
After working 20 years at an insurance company, Pyong Young Do now spends most of his time outdoors. He's taken up photography as a hobby and even invested $500 in a new camera. I'm living for myself, doing the things I've always wanted to do. I don't have any debt or major bills, so I spend about a third of my monthly allowance on myself. Pyon is one of the country's so-called active seniors. In Korea, active seniors are people that are socially and economically active and willing to spend money to improve the quality of their lives. Unlike generations before them, a growing number of Koreans in their 50s and 60s aren't relying on their children for financial support. They are independent and have disposable incomes. And they're spending big on leisure activities and buying up items like cameras, art supplies and outdoor gear, and even paying for continued education. Now that my children are grown up, I have time to spend my money and enjoy my own life. I play the guitar and take singing lessons. So what's made them different from their predecessors? Many members of the baby boomer generation are well-educated, had good-paying jobs and were able to save up. They were the main consumers during Korea's industrialization period and have more interest in leisure, fashion and health than seniors of the past. Data shows consumers aged 50 to 64 spent $40 billion in 2010, and in five years, their buying power is expected to triple. Experts say this comes as more than 80 percent of them return to the job market after retirement to pursue the work they were passionate about when they were younger. Kim min Arirang News. Bringing you the fresh updates from stories breaking in Korea and abroad. We give you a bigger and better picture of the world. Join Na Hyung Young live from Seoul every weekday only on Arirang. The U.S. State Department has changed a map of Korea on its website to include a reference to Korea's easternmost Dokdo Island. The rocky islets had not been marked on the Korea map of the State Department's U.S. Passports and International Travel section, but had been shown as the Leonkert Rocks on Japan's map. Seoul's foreign ministry protested to Washington that the island's omission from the Korea map incorrectly gave the impression that it belongs to Japan. In addition, both the State Department's Korea and Japan maps continue to use Sea of Japan for the body of water between the two countries. Seoul has been pushing to Washington to, use, to also use the Korean name East Sea. After an 11-day absence, Russian President Vladimir Putin is back in the public eye. Not only did he dismiss the rumors that he was critically ill or even deposed as simple gossip, but he also ordered a significant show of force. Russia's northern fleet in the Arctic launched military drills of, quote, full combat readiness moving to action, some 40,000 troops as well as dozens of warships. Russia's defense minister told local media that the snap five-day inspections come amid new security threats. Meanwhile, the European Union reiterated on Monday that it would stick to its policy of not legitimatizing what it called Russia's illegal takeover of Crimea. The EU also voiced concerns over a military buildup and a worsening human rights situation in that contested peninsula. The president of Vanuatu is appealing for immediate international help after a monster cyclone ravaged his South Pacific island nation over the weekend. Aid teams are beginning to stream in as the devastation is just starting to be assessed. The National Disaster Management Office said 24 people were killed by tropical cyclone Pam, adding that the figure could rise as communication was still being restored with remote islands of the Arctic. Archipelago. Cyclone Pam brought winds of more than 300 kilometers per hour, wreaking havoc in the poor island nation, washing away roads and bridges, smashing buildings, and displacing some 3,300 people. 
Now back here in Korea, gone are the days when candidates campaigned with posters and leaflets. Now they are jumping on the social media bandwagon to draw in potential young supporters. Kwon Soa takes a look. As Korea's rival parties gear up for April's by-elections, they are trying to win the hearts of young voters through more novel campaign methods than the usual posters and leaflets. This teaser shows a young unemployed man complaining about his situation, when suddenly the ruling Senori party's chairman appears in front of him. It's an advertisement for an application naming contest. It's hoped the app will boost young people's participation in the political process. The main opposition New Politics Alliance for Democracy is using webtoons as a means of explaining hot political issues in an easy-to-digest way. We're doing this in an effort to not let complicated policies be discussed only at the National Assembly, but to connect with young voters. Due to high social network service penetration, these video clips and digital comics spread quickly, making it easier for the parties to spread their vision to the younger generation. But there are concerns about whether this is the best way to go about campaigning. When young people look at content on SNS or Webtoons, they simply enjoy it and they don't take it that seriously. That's why there needs to be a more thorough understanding of cultural phenomena and young people's opinions, especially when the subject matter is so heavy and important. Some say that rather than focusing too much on how to make themselves more likable, the parties should come up with practical strategies to tackle the biggest problems facing young people in Korea, such as the high youth unemployment rate. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. And on the cultural front, Korea has hosted a diverse range of plays and now the Korean theater community is aiming to expand with new talent and more original plays. Our Im Yun Hee has a look at two new plays being put on here in Seoul. Take a look. There's been an accident. But whose fault is it? The fox or the human? It's even harder to distinguish which is the fox and which is the human. The original Korean play, The Human Fox, has a Mobius strip-like structure, with no seeming end or beginning, to this ever-ongoing cycle. The play boasts a creative staff made up of some of the leading Korean figures in the industry. Written by one of Korea's leading playwrights, Lee kang Baek, it's a thought-provoking play that brings a little mystery and a lot of laughter to its audience. I get frustrated when I'm not myself, and that frustration for others as well, because it's an endless cycle, a repetition of the past, and the inability to move on to the future. Another new original Korean play to recently hit the stage, but this production has more of a fantastical flair. The comedy crime thriller sets a stage suited to its name. There's a large glowing bull at the center of attention. And although it's considered a play, with all the flashing lights, special effects and a live band, it's more like a spectacular variety show. It's okay to enjoy this production without a single thought in mind. But at the same time, while watching it, the fluid gates will open, and many different thoughts and ideas may come into your mind. But beneath the fun and games, the play also has a serious side, offering the audience a range of different emotions. Original Korean plays still have room to grow, but with plenty of creativity and talent to go around, they're sure to make a splash in the future. Im Yun Hee, Arirang News. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Shaw Park here with the latest weather forecast. We have another mild day here in Korea, but today the fine dust index is high in some regions, and at the moment it's very high here in Seoul and the surrounding areas. Now, the sky is also cloudy due to the influence of pressure trough coming from north and south of the peninsula. So there may be times we'll, we'll be getting some raindrops here in Seoul during the day and on Jeju and down south by this evening. 
The rain will expand nationwide tomorrow until Thursday morning, so have your umbrellas handy. Temperatures, by the way, will stay mild, but don't forget the huge temperature drops in the mornings tonight. Now let's have a look at the readings for today. So we'll pick up to 16 this afternoon, while the southern regions such as Gwangju and Busan will be higher at 23 and 18 degrees respectively. Moving over to other regions, Jeju Island gets up to 19, Dokdo hits 17, while Long Kungang is rainy at 7 degrees. Well, that's all for now. I'm Shaw Park, and I hope you have a wonderful day. And that's a wrap from us at this hour. I'm Na Hyun Kyung in Seoul. Thanks for staying with us. More updates coming up at 6 p.m. Korea time.